probably one of my main research interests so far is how to analyze high dimensional data, how to study data which, in which you have a set of vectors which have many components. And the reason I want to study that is because a lot of times when you're trying to study biological systems, the data that you can extract is really complex and it oftentimes takes the form of a very uh, a list of numbers, a vector which is in a high dimensional space. You have many different, you know, to describe one object, you have many, many different attributes that you can record. So in an earlier video, I gave the example of describing a human being and listing off things like their height, weight, their sex, their geographical location, uh, ethnic background, hair color, like all these different possible attributes that can describe a person. Um, another example is if, you know, the human genome, you have a long list, a long sequence of nucleotide bases, which each at each position you could have one of four um, different nucleotides. So you can think of that as like one long vector. And it's likely that people from the same family are going to have similar sequences. So the vector representing their genome is going to lie in about the same region of this very high dimensional space. And what's cool about this kind of data is that it oftentimes will reveal or there are patterns that lie sort of encoded in this set of vectors. The patterns which say something about how the system behaves or how it's structured. And before speaking about it generally, I'll go and give one example of how this kind of thing can come up. So I've worked on this project where you have, you're trying to analyze satellite images and look at the differences in texture um, in the image to try to identify different types of biomes, different um, types of landscape ecologies using the, the colors and the textures in the image as a proxy for like what plants are there, what type of soil and stuff is there. You can think about dividing this whole image into patches, like sub-images, little squares that are, have overlap. And for each patch, there's a set of pixels, each with a different color. And to represent one color, you can represent it as a red, green, blue vector, so three numbers. So for a given little patch, you have a list of these three-dimensional vectors. And each one of these uh, red, green, blue vectors falls into a certain area in the three-dimensional color space. And so what I did was I used k-means to divide this RGB space into 100 different regions. And then each pixel within the patch falls into exactly one of those regions. So from a given patch we obtain a hundred numbers representing how many pixels within that patch fall into each of the 100 bins. We now have a 100 dimensional vector associated to each two-dimensional grid point. And if you imagine shifting that patch around, the values in that 100 dimensional vector are going to also shift and they're going to do so smoothly. So you would probably expect that the corresponding set of points in the 100 dimensional space forms some kind of continuous object. It's not going to be something which is just ran completely uniformly distributed and filling up the space. It's going to be something which is kind of like an embedded mesh or uh, some kind of surface, maybe the surface kind of curves in on itself or has some kind of shape, but it's not going to be random. It's going to be kind of some object which is smoothly changing. That is the idea of data manifolds in nature. It's like when you extract this high dimensional data, a lot of times it's going to change smoothly like that and it's going to lie on some kind of object which is a subset of the space that it's in. The vector itself is uh, kind of acts as a signature. In this example, the vector acts as a signature of what's going on in the patch. Like it's representing the patch as one object. And contained within that vector is some kind of information about 
what's going on in the object or the identity of the object. Okay, so we know that these 100-dimensional histogram vectors are going to lie on some kind of manifold in the 100-dimensional space, which we can't see. One of the goals of dimensionality reduction, and in particular the area called uh, nonlinear manifold learning, is to extract that manifold structure in such a way that we can view it in a lower dimensional space. So again, the goal of all dimensionality reduction is you start with a set of points in a high dimensional space. You obtain usually, uh, as an intermediate step, you obtain a similarity matrix, but you don't always have to. And then from that, you obtain a configuration of points in a lower dimensional space, such as R2 or R3, where we can now view some semblance of the structure of the high dimensional set of points. And that lower dimensional set of points is usually called an embedding. So some examples of nonlinear manifold learning methods are LTSA, uh, ISOMAP, LLE, um, there's one called manifold sculpting, which I couldn't get to work very well. <laughs> and these methods are specifically designed under the assumption that the data in the high dimensional space has some kind of underlying manifold structure to it. And they try to extract that and represent it faithfully in the lower dimensional embedding. So here's another really fascinating example of where you can observe a data manifold in nature. So a handful of authors have experimented with applying dimensionality reduction to a video sequence. So in this example, they took a video of a bird flying through the air, and the bird is centered in the middle of the frame and is continuously changing its shape as it's flapping. For each frame of the video, if the image has n pixels, they string that out, they reshape it into an n-dimensional vector. And it turns out that when you apply dimensionality reduction to this set of vectors, each one representing a frame, you obtain something which is essentially like an orbit for the video. You obtain a trajectory which shows a point that smoothly moves through the space. And it makes sense because the bird is smoothly changing its shape, and so the corresponding image vector is smoothly changing its values. They also tested this with a video of a swinging pendulum and just goes back and forth like on a clock. It doesn't lose momentum or anything. And they observed a completely circular orbit. And that makes sense because the video is cyclic. It just keeps repeating kind of the same uh, sequence over and over again effectively. And so this point in the embedding just keeps going around and around in a loop. So in both these cases, we see this other kind of data manifold where even though we can't see the trajectory of this high dimensional image vector in its space, um, when we use dimensionality reduction, we can see that these vectors are lying on some kind of object or they're staying closely packed into a certain region of the space. And that uh, object that they're lying on is what I would call the data manifold. So I did my own experiment to try to discover a similar data manifold where I simulated these four particles which are moving on a line and which are kind of all mutually attracted to each other. They can pass through each other and they're kind of perpetually out of equilibrium and they end up uh, moving chaotically. Through a certain way of representation, I formed a vector representing a snapshot of the system at each point in time. So now this collection of snapshots forms a trajectory in a high dimensional space um, representing the evolution of the system over time. Then I applied a dimensionality reduction technique called uh, T-SNE to bring this into three-dimensional space. Lo and behold, this embedded trajectory, we can see it lies, appears to lie on some kind of attractor, and the attractor actually has a kind of nice flow on it. In other words, it doesn't look like a random walk, but it actually looks like a, 
it has some kind of nice flow on it, like it's like a ball of hair or a ball of yarn. <laughs> this reminded me of a similar mathematical object, which is called a strange attractor. The canonical example is like the Lorentz attractor. When you have a chaotic dynamical system, you observe the orbit or in the very long term. The orbit of a chaotic system will remain on it will remain on this particular shape and it kind of moves chaotically from from wing to wing. This type of behavior is really a hallmark of chaotic systems. So with any chaotic system, you can expect to observe the state of the system to bounce around in a localized region of its phase space. And it's not ever going to repeat its prior dynamics, but it's going to maybe come really close to repeating. So in other words, it's going to be acyclic, but it's going to be bounded to a localized region. And of course, there's the sensitive dependence on initial conditions. There's a consistency in the bird's dynamics. There's a sort of self-consistency where the bird or related systems exhibit approximately the same behavior through time, although they may not be exactly repeating like the pendulum. Intuitively, because the bird, the image of the bird is not changing too drastically, the embedding of that point is not going to move too far away from its prior states. So that's why it has to stay in the same local area. I got interested in this by observing a fountain and noticing that it, there's a kind of consistency to the way it behaves even though it may not exactly repeat. It, the dynamics is kind of qualitatively consistent through time. And so I kind of set out to find a way to capture this what I ultimately discovered was that if you take a snapshot of the system at each point in time and represent it as a high dimensional vector and then you observe the orbit of that vector, the orbit will remain in a tight bundle in the embedding space. And the fact that it keeps moving around in that general area reflects the fact that the dynamics are consistent. You can imagine uh, if the shape of the fountain remains approximately the same, its vector representation has to be approximately the same through time, so it can't start diverging away to a different part of the space, because that would mean that the shape is like totally changing to something else. And there's a connection between these attractors that we've observed for the video sequence and the idea of strange attractors, which come from chaotic systems. The consistency in the dynamics of that system is reflected by the fact that the orbit will remain on this butterfly wing shape. Again, we have an instance where you have this kind of data manifold that the orbit is lying on. And its consistency, the, 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 if you observe the point, it kind of just keeps looping back between the two wings in an unpredictable kind of way. But that's still a kind of consistency, and I think it's just really interesting, the connection between that and the fact that in these systems like the fountain or the bird, you also observe something which is kind of like a strange attractor. This phenomenon of qualitative consistency of dynamics is extremely widespread. Once you start looking for it, you start noticing that a lot of systems behave like this. Even the behavior of like an animal or a human being, which is a highly complex system, they're doing approximately the same behavior day to day, even though the particulars of your day are changing. You know, if you observe an insect or an animal over the long term, you can see they're doing essentially the same types of behaviors. They have like a limited repertoire of things that they do. In simpler systems, you know, it's like I can hear it in the sound of a babbling creek where it kind of, the consistency in the dynamics of the water is also reflected in the sound that it produces. And it kind of almost sounds like white noise, like it's just this chaotic stream that keeps doing approximately the same thing through time. <laughs>